basic moral conduct. It is important to recognize some general principles that assist in the proper practice of moral conduct at all levels and enable one to practice the Dhamma correctly, Dhamma Nu Dhamma Pati Pati. The Buddha's words above defining the path factors of right speech, right action and right livelihood reveal the essence of Sila and they describe the necessary guidelines of moral conduct required for a virtuous life. Teachers from ancient times later compiled the eight subsidiary factors of moral conduct derived from these three path factors and called them by the name the set of eight precepts of which pure livelihood is the eighth. Awidja Ta Makasila. <coughs> These are the essential factors of moral conduct. From here, the analysis of moral conduct branches out. For example, when one describes a training for a specific group of people with a distinctive way of life, with distinct objectives and course of development. One may distinguish various details of practice as the moral conduct for monks, not for nuns, for novices, for the laity, etc. <coughs> Moreover, a clear system of communal management may be established, defined to as a moral discipline, Vinaya, which includes measures for restraint, administration, the exacting of penalties on transgressors, etc. <coughs> the Buddha's words on the path factors of moral conduct reveal that the path is not intended only for the community of monks. Otherwise, the definition for sila would have to be the 227 precepts. The virtuous conduct for bhikkhus, bhikkhu sila, the morality of renunciance, Babajita Sila, or something along these lines. The Buddha taught the essence of moral conduct in a way that incorporates diverse and detailed moral principles and precepts. It was not necessary for him to bestow formal titles on some of these subsidiary guidelines for conduct. For example, he mentioned the five precepts, the eight precepts, and the ten precepts without giving them explicit names. Because it is often forgotten, it, would, it should be emphasized that Sila does not refer only to virtuous physical and verbal actions, but also includes a pure and virtuous livelihood. The way one earns a living has an important bearing on virtuous conduct. In the scriptural classification of moral precepts, normally only the main subjects are mentioned. For example, to refrain from destroying living creatures or to refrain from stealing. By glancing at these main subjects, one may only see them in a negative or negating light. To gain a complete and clear understanding of these precepts, one needs to look at the Buddha's words elaborating on their meanings. In the teaching on the Ten Wholesome Courses of Action, Kusala Kamapata, for instance, one sees that almost every factor is divided into two parts. There is an aspect to, to be refrained from and an aspect to be performed. A negating quality is followed by a positive quality. <coughs> the teaching begins with abstaining from an evil action, example killing, <coughs> and this is followed by an encouragement to perform a good action that opposes the unskillful action. <coughs> example compassionately assisting all living creatures. The path consists of moral conduct concentration on wisdom which must be fully integrated in order for the fruits of the path to be achieved 
Although here the discussion focuses on moral conduct, one needs to be aware that this is merely one stage of an integrated progress process. When one advances on the path, moral conduct must, must be linked with the other two factors in order to reach true success. Technically speaking, the fulfillment and perfection resulting from the complete integration of the path factors is called the unity of spiritual qualities, Dhamma Samagi. Even at the highest level of complete awakening, there must be this integration of factors. When one gains an appreciation of this integration of factors, Although one may be focusing on the factors pertaining to moral conduct, one will be aware of the remaining factors and the role that they play. <clears throat> the teaching on the Ten Wholesome Courses of Action expands the path factors in a way that may be applied by all human beings. These ten factors are described as factors leading to true humanity. Manusa Dhamma. It is evident in this teaching that moral conduct is accompanied by mental and wisdom development. The first seven factors pertain to moral conduct, factors eight and nine pertain to concentration, and the tenth factor pertains to wisdom. The five precepts, however, which is considered the most basic form of acceptable moral conduct encompasses only the stage of sila, not of samadhi or panya. This indicates that the five precepts alone are inadequate for truly advancing on the Buddhist path. When one is unable to develop the higher spiritual qualities, at the very least one should abstain from wickedness and try not to seriously harm others. <coughs> Having said this, the five precepts are not excluded from the unity of spiritual factors, Dhamma, Sama, Ki, in those circumstances when it was appropriate to distinguish moral conduct as a distinct category. The Buddha would prepare a complementary teaching containing factors pertaining to the mind, Chitta, and wisdom, Panya. Here, these three factors are not placed together in a single group as they are in the Ten Wholesome Courses of Action. He would teach those lay people who began their spiritual practice by upholding the five precepts to complete their training by developing the mind and wisdom so that they may become awakened disciples. This alternative presentation of integrated spiritual factors is used as a teaching specifically for householders and it usually contains four factors, faith, virtuous conduct, generosity and wisdom. Occasionally the fifth factor of learning is added. This group of factors is mentioned very frequently in the Tipitaka. Here is a concise summary of this teaching. <clears throat> After mentioning the means by which one gains victory in this world, by properly managing one's home, domestic help, financial earnings, etc., which are matters pertaining to immediate benefits, dita da mi kata, the Buddha speaks about the means by which one gains victory in the world to come. Pertaining to future benefits, from para i kata, possessing four qualities, visaka, a woman practices for victory in the next world and makes ready for the next world. What for? <coughs> One. And how is a woman accomplished in faith, sada? Here a woman is endowed with faith. She has conviction in the awakening of the tathagata, tathagata bodhi sada. Thus, the Blessed One is Narahan. Two, and how is a woman accomplished in virtuous conduct? Sila. Here a woman abstains from the destruction of life, from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, from spirits and intoxicants, 
the basis for heedlessness. Three, and how is a woman accomplished in generosity? Kaga, here a woman dwells at home with a heart devoid of the stain of miserliness, freely generous, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment, devoted to charity, delighting in giving and sharing. Four, and how is a woman accomplished in wisdom? Panya, here a woman is wise, she possesses the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away which is noble and penetrative, and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. The fifth factor, which is desirable but not imperative, is learning, sutta, learning by way of formal education, reading, listening, etc., which refers to acquiring the raw data for knowledge. If one develops great learning, by whose sutta, this is even more advantageous. Many Buddhists are concerned only, only with moral conduct. They may be aware of other aspects of the teachings, but their knowledge is often confused and unsystematic. Even though the Buddha clearly outlined a complete spiritual development of Sila, Samadhi and Panya, he reiterated how householders should be endowed with faith, sara, moral conduct, Sila, specifically the five precepts learning, sutta, generosity, kaga, and wisdom, panya. When one reaches this unity of spiritual factors at this level, the noble path, Aryamaga, is accessible for cultivation. <coughs> the Pali term sila has a very broad scope of meaning. It can be used in very specific contexts or in a general sense. And as mentioned earlier, it is important to be able to distinguish this term from the term Vinaya. Principles of Dhamma may be divided into the three factors of moral conduct, Sila, Concentration, Samadhi and Wisdom, Panya. Concentration and Wisdom pertain exclusively to Dhamma, whereas moral conduct may be divided into a principle of Dhamma and also into a conventional disciplinary code, Vinaya. Vinaya is one aspect of Sila. See the section Sila on the level of Dhamma and Sila on the level of Vinaya below. Following are some teachings by the Buddha summarizing basic moral principles in relation to ordinary people and clarifying the meaning and essence of the term Sila. Fundamental Principles of Morality let us view the three path factors pertaining to morality. One, right speech, sama wa cha. One, to relinquish wrong speech, musa wa da. To abstain from telling lies, this factor includes speaking truthfully, sata wa cha. Two, to relinquish divisive speech, bisuna wa cha. To abstain from malicious tale bearing. This factor includes harmonizing reconciliatory speech from Maga Kari Karani Vata. Three to relinquish to relinquish harsh speech Patrusa Vata to abstain from offensive speech. This factor includes pleasant polite speech Sanha Vata. Four to relinquish unreflective chatter Sam Pa La pa, to abstain from trivial talk, this factor includes useful beneficial speech. Atta Sanhita Vacha to right action. Sama Kamanta <coughs> one to relinquish this the to relinquish destruction of life, Banati Pata to abstain from killing living creatures. This factor includes deeds of aid and support. Two, to relinquish taking what is not freely given, Adinadana. To abstain from stealing. This factor is paired with right livelihood or with generosity, Dana. Three, to relinquish misconduct in relation to sensual pleasures, Kame Sumi Chachara. To abstain from sexual misconduct. This factor includes contentment with one's wife. Satara Santosa. 
three right livelihood, sama a jiwa, to relinquish wrong livelihood, to earn one's living righteously. This factor includes a perseverance in maintaining an upright livelihood. For example, by not leaving matters in arrears, i.e. not allowing work to pile up and be disorderly, not procrastinating and not making half-hearted effort. The Buddha applied these essential guidelines of moral conduct to ordinary people, describing basic principles of behaviour which are suitable for human beings to live together happily and to lead wholesome lives free from excessive conflict. These principles are referred to in the Pali Canon as the Five Training Rules, Sika Pada, which were later commonly referred to as the Five Precepts, Panchasila. Let us review these precepts. 1. To abstain from killing living creatures, Panati Pada. Essentially, this refers to conduct that is free from physical oppression of other beings. To, ab to abstain from taking what is not freely given, Adinadana, to abstain from stealing. Essentially, this refers to conduct that is free from transgressing others in the context of material property and possessions. 3. To abstain from sexual misconduct, Kami, Su, Mi, Cha, Chara. Essentially, this refers to conduct that is free from harming others in the context of married partners and cherished individuals, from transgressing sexual mores and traditions, from adultery and from sexual behaviour that damages a family's reputation and lineage. <coughs> Four, to abstain from speaking falsehoods, Nusawada. Essentially, this refers to conduct that is free from transgressing others by telling lies or by speaking in order to take advantage or to cause harm. 5. To abstain from spirits, liquor and intoxicants. Shura, Meira, Ya, Maja, which are a basis for heedlessness, essentially. This refers to conduct that is free from recklessness and intoxication due to the use of addictive substances that impair mindfulness and clear comprehension. Standard definitions of the five precepts along with similar moral precepts have been handed down from scholars and commentators to later generations. To begin with, let us look at some teachings by the Buddha on this subject. I will teach you, householders, a Dharma exposition applicable to oneself. Here, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus, uh, one who wishes to live, who does not wish to die. I cherish happiness and am averse to suffering. Since I am one who wishes to live and am averse to suffering, if someone were to take my life, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now if I were to take the life of another, of one who wishes to live, who does not wish to die, who cherishes happiness and is averse to suffering, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other either. What is displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other too. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having reflected thus, he himself abstains from the destruction of life, exhorts others to abstain from the destruction of life, and speaks in praise of abstinence from the destruction of life. Thus this bodily conduct of his is purified in three respects. Again, householder, a noble disciple, reflects thus, if someone were to take from me what I have not given, that is, to commit theft, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now if I were to take from another what he has not given, that is, to commit theft, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other either. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus, if someone were to commit adultery with my wife, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. 
Now, if I were to commit adultery with the wife of another, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other either. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus, if someone were to damage my welfare with false speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to damage the welfare of another with false speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other either. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus, if someone were to instigate a split between me and my friends by divisive speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to instigate a split between another and the his friends by divisive speech that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other either. <clears throat> Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus If someone were to address me with harsh speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to address another with harsh speech, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other either. Again, householders, a noble disciple reflects thus, if someone were to address me with frivolous speech and idle chatter, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to me. Now, if I were to address another with frivolous speech and idle chatter, that would not be pleasing and agreeable to the other either. What is displeasing and disagreeable to me is displeasing and disagreeable to the other. How can I inflict upon another what is displeasing and disagreeable to me? Having inflicted thus, he himself abstains from idle chatter, exhorts others to abstain from idle chatter, and speaks in praise of abstinence from idle chatter. Thus this verbal conduct of his is purified in three respects. What do you think, monks? Have you ever seen or heard of the following? This man has abandoned the taking of life. He is one who abstains from the taking of life. And kings seize him and execute him, imprison him, banish him, or impose a punishment on him for this reason. No venerable, sir. Good, monks. I too have never seen or heard of the following. But if they announce some evil deeds as this, this man has caused the death of a woman or man, then kings, because he has taken life, seize him and execute, imprison, banish or impose a punishment on him. Has such a thing been seen or heard of by you? Lord, this thing has been both seen and heard of by us and we shall hear of it again. What do you think, monks? Have you ever seen or heard of the following? This man has abandoned the taking of what is not given. He is one who abstains from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, from spirits and intoxicants that are a basis for heedlessness. And kings seize him and execute him, imprison him, banish him, or impose a punishment on him for abstaining from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from speaking falsely, from indulging in spirits and intoxicants. No venerable sir. Good monks, I too have never seen or heard of the following, but if they announce some evil deed as this, this man has stolen something from a village or a forest. This man has violated. This man violated the wives and daughters of others. This man has brought to ruin a householder or a householder's son with false speech. This man has given over to drinking wines and spirits and has killed a woman or man. This man is given over to drinking wines and spirits and has stolen something from a village or a forest. This man is given over to drinking wines and spirits and has violated the wives and daughters of others. This man is given over to drinking wines and spirits and has brought to ruin a householder, a householder's son with a false speech. Then kings, because he has stolen, he has committed sexual misconduct. He has spoken falsely. He has indulged in wines and spirits. Kings seize him. 
and executes in prison banish or impose a punishment on him has such a thing been seen or heard of by you lord this thing has been both seen and heard of by us and we shall hear of it again <coughs> Almost all serious crime stems from a transgression of the five precepts. In societies containing widespread killing, mutual animosity, persecution, sexual misconduct, murder, theft, rape, deceit, abuse of intoxicants and addictive drugs, along with the resulting problems and causalities of drug and alcohol abuse, human life and people's possessions are not safe. Wherever people go, they experience anxiety and fear. When people meet, instead of feeling relaxed and at ease, they become mistrustful of one another. People's mental health deteriorates and it is difficult for people to develop spiritual power and virtue. Such a society is not a supportive environment for cultivating spiritual virtue because people are preoccupied with resolving social conflict and chaos, which often increases in intensity. <coughs> For this reason, an absence of an adherence to the five precepts is a measuring stick to determine the level of social decay. The keeping of the five precepts marks the behavior and way of life that is opposite to the unwholesome actions listed above. Keeping the five precepts is the most basic criterion for determining human moral conduct. To keep these precepts preserves a healthy social environment and acts as a foundation for a virtuous way of life and for greater spiritual development. For convenience, the commentators compiled a list of criteria for determining what actions constitute a transgression of each of the five precepts, establishing the necessary conditions, sambara, or factors, anga, of transgression. One has transgressed or broken a precept when one fulfills all the necessary conditions as follows. <coughs> Transgression of the first precept, killing living creatures, contains five factors. 1. The creature, person or animal possesses life. 2. One knows that the creature is alive. 3. There is an intention to kill. 4. There is an effort to kill. 5. The creature dies as a consequence of that effort. Transgression of the second precept. Stealing contains five factors. One, the object is considered a personal possession by someone else. Two, one knows that the other person considers the object a personal possession. Three, there is an intention to steal. Four, there is an effort to steal. Five, the theft is successful through that effort. Transgression of the third precept, sexual misconduct, contains four factors. One, there is a man or a woman or a woman who should not be violated. Two, there is an intention to have sexual intercourse. Three, there is an effort to have intercourse. Four, there is a way through. There is contact of the sexual organs. Transgression of the fourth precept, false speech, contains four factors. One, the speech is untrue. Two, there is an intention to speak falsely. Three, there is an effort resulting from that intention. Four, another person comprehends that which has been spoken. Transgression of the fifth precept, consuming liquor, spirits and intoxicants contains four factors. 1. The substance is an intoxicant. 2. There is a desire to consume the substance. 3. There is an effort resulting from that desire. 4. The substance is swallowed and passes the person's throat. 
In regard to the first precept, although the scriptures focus primarily on not killing human beings, as in the quotes by the Buddha above, animals too cherish life, delight in happiness, and are averse to pain, and are companions in this world of birth, old age, sickness, and death, and they too should not be oppressed. The first precept thus includes animals in the definition of living creatures. Granted, the scriptures claim that comically killing animals is less of a serious consequence than killing human beings. In regard to this matter, the commentaries offer principles for judging the severity of evil effect, ill effect resulting from transgressing the five precepts based on various criteria. Later generations of Buddhist monastic scholars compiled a group of factors paired with the five precepts to be applied by Buddhist lay people in tandem with the precepts. These factors are known as the five virtues, Panchadharma, or the five beautiful qualities, Panchakalayana Dhamma. <clears throat> in essence, they correspond to the factors of the wholesome courses of action, Kusala, Kama, Pata, with some variation depending on the breadth of definition and application. These five factors follow the order of the five precepts as follows. 1. Loving kindness, metta and compassion, Karuna. To right livelihood, Sama Ajiva, some scholars substitute or include generosity, Dana, three sense restraint, Kama Samara, to possess self control in regard to sense impressions and sense desires, and to not allow these to lead to immoral behavior. Some scholars substitute Satara Santosa, contentment with one's spouse. 4. Honesty, Satcha. 5. Mindfulness, Sati and clear comprehension, Sampajana. Some scholars substitute heedfulness, Apamada, which has essentially the same meaning. Saddara Santosa, which stands in opposition to sexual misconduct, literally translates as contentment with one's wife, but at heart it means contentment with one's spouse. From a broad perspective, this factor is based on mutual agreement and consent, and also on conformity with social conventions and rules. To not mistreat or be unfaithful to one's spouse, to not act against the consent of the other person involved, and to not violate someone who is off limits, someone who is under the authority or care of someone else. Although this factor does not firmly stipulate a single spouse in contrast to numerous spouses, Buddhist texts favour the and commend monogamy, for it leads to long-lasting mutual love and respect to a stable family in which the children feel secure and at ease. The model couple in the suttas for such a monogamous relationship are the noble disciples Nakula Pita and Nakula Mata. They were both stream enterers and are considered the foremost lay disciples, Eta Daga, in respect to being in a close relationship to the Buddha. They had a deep love, devotion, and loyalty to one another and were equally matched in spiritual virtues to the point that they expressed a wish to meet not only in this lifetime but in future lifetimes. Here are the recorded words of Nakula Pita. Lord, ever since the young housewife Nakula Mata was brought home to me when I was still young, I have never been aware of acting unfaithfully towards her even in my thoughts, still less in my deeds. Lord, our wish is to be together so long as this life lasts and in the future life as well. Nakula Mata uttered the same words. 
The Turks classify contentment with one's spouse as a form of divine conduct, Brahmacharya, which shows how highly praised this quality is in the Buddhist teachings. The commentators state that such pure conduct is a cause for not dying young, as in this passage. We are not unfaithful to our wives, and our wives are not unfaithful to us. We practice chastity, brahmacharya, in regards to other women apart from our wives. Therefore, none of us has died while still young. To sum up, the following verses describe basic moral conduct in a nutshell. A person who is composed in body, speech and mind, who does not perform any evil acts, who does not utter senseless self-serving speech, such a one is called a virtuous person. Make yourself a refuge for all beings.